for day two of the fundamentals of network lighting controls. As people are filtering in, uh, we will pause for just a moment or two to allow folks to come in before we start the actual uh, webinar. Before we start, I will encourage those of you who are here uh, currently. Uh, I threw a whole bunch of information at you really, really fast yesterday. If you have any questions about anything we went over yesterday, uh, other than the homework, because we'll go through that at length, um, please go ahead and feel free to post that in the questions box now, and uh, I will get to them uh, when, uh, when we start the, the full broadcast. Okay, it's just a little after 10, so let's get started while people are kind of trickling in here. Welcome to day two, everyone. Thank you for coming back promptly. I think you've got a lot to go over today. Um, and there is Sean right there if you haven't heard him speak yet. Um, just a reminder, everybody's going to be muted, um, but there is the chance to ask questions over in the chat box. Um, that'll come straight to Sean and me, and Sean can um, take some time to address your questions uh, during the course. Um, there's also the polls. Thank you for participating in those yesterday. And then after the class, a survey um, for this segment of the class. Um, and again, uh, there's going to be a recording up on our web page. We have a new uh, dedicated page for those as it's been kind of a, kind of buried in our website. If you ever tried to look for it before, um, I posted the link in the chat yesterday. I'll probably post it again today. It, it takes a few days to get up. So if you need to reference anything uh, going forward, give it a few days and then it'll be up there. And there's our email address if you have questions. And again, we are Seattle City Light employees. The Lighting Design Lab is powered by Seattle City Light. Um, and this presentation in particular is um, uh, brought to you with help from Better Bricks from Mia. And I think away we go. All right. Thank you, Katie. Uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone, once again. So anybody who didn't uh, didn't hear the announcement uh, a few moments ago. Um, before we get going, talking about uh, homework, uh, the the sort of uh, loose homework assignment that I gave you yesterday, uh, I threw a ton of information at you, really rapid fire yesterday. Um, 
who, you know, we talked about some of the rationales why we would use advanced lighting controls. We talked about some of the strategies of uh, advanced lighting controls or network lighting controls. We talked about some of the hardware typologies. We'll talk a lot more about the actual specific hardware today uh, with respect to some of that stuff. Um, and we also talked uh, about sort of the really, really down and dirty fundamentals of lighting controls, right? Which, if you'll remember, we talked about uh, scene and we talked about control zone and we talked about circuit, right? Those to me are the three very basic fundamental sort of atomic building blocks of, of lighting controls, right? Everything else depends from that, those three concepts. So, um, Again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please go ahead and type them now. Also, uh, we are about to go through the homework, and I would love to have some feedback from you guys uh, before and as we're going through it. If you type them in the questions box, that'd be terrific. Um, did, did you find, A, I guess, did you do the homework? Um, did you find that it made sense to you or maybe more sense to you about how to think about organizing lighting controls for a variety of different uh, room types based on uh, what we were talking about yesterday? Um, we're going to go through it in depth uh, in a few moments so that, um, you know, I'll at least give you a sense of how I would consider uh, applying lighting controls to this project in two different ways. So um, if you have any feedback on that stuff, if you have any questions, now would be an excellent time to go ahead and type those things in. It's also a good excuse for me to have a little bit more coffee. All right. Uh, wait, uh, chat. Chat messages. I see. I didn't realize chat was active as well as the questions box, but I guess it is. All right. Um, I guess nobody has any questions or, or comments on the homework. All right. Well, fair enough. Why don't we dive right into it then? Uh, so, uh, but if you do have uh, other questions or comments about it, uh, please go ahead and, and type them in and I will be glad to, uh, glad to discuss them as we move forward. So to recap, uh, our project that we were looking at here is uh, Tech Offices X. So Tech X is uh, you know, any given uh, high tech uh, company. Uh, many of the sort of big conglomerate uh, software companies organize themselves in this manner around kind of um, uh, what they call neighborhoods, office neighborhoods, right? So to recap, and let me not forget to go ahead and put on my spotlight tool. There we go. Uh, to recap, um, I gave you plans, uh, renderings, sections, a whole bunch of other information. Um, I also gave you over here, you'll note, um, these are some of the typical system startup tasks that you might be engaged in in any given um, lighting control system. So that hopefully gives you a little bit uh, more information about things like sequence of operations and stuff like that. So I'm going to um, go at this in two different ways. Uh, first, I'm going to um, sort of take a traditional network lighting controls approach. What I mean by that is that um, a parts and pieces approach where um, some folks describe this as um, network lighting controls being one control controlling many luminaires versus luminaire level lighting control being one luminaire is one control zone, right? Uh, with a network lighting control system, you can have you can have every light fixture be its own zone as well. It's just less common, right? Um, and then you would also have um, a smaller number of sensors, for example, occupancy, vacancy, daylight sensors that would be talking uh, to the stuff. So that would be a more traditional approach. Uh, there's one question here. Hello, David. Uh, would the bank of overhead lights in the larger room adjacent to the windows want a different zone from the parallel bank of lights? 
Uh, that's a good question. We will dive into that right now. So let me move forward. So in the traditional uh, network lighting controls approach, um, we would want to uh, determine control zones, right? Uh, that's the very fundamental thing. What are the light fixtures that want to be able to dim up and down together? So in this particular case, at the very least, let's look at the open office for the moment, we have a window wall here, right? Now, we haven't talked uh, specifically about um, uh, energy codes yet, but I'm hoping that it's not a surprise to anybody to know that uh, daylighting controls are required in basically every energy code I'm aware of on the planet. And here in Seattle, if we're doing this in Seattle, um, we wind up uh, having a primary and a secondary daylight zone, right? Any, in fact, any place that is governed by the IECC, which is the International Energy Conservation Code, will have that requirement. So we will wind up having a window wall here, right? And the requirement is that uh, the primary daylight zone is um, as far into the space as the head height of the window, right? The top of the window. If you looked at the section that I gave you on this, the top of the window is, is um, nine feet. So conveniently enough, it's 18 feet deep. So we would have a dividing line down the center where we would have a primary daylight zone and a secondary daylight zone. So if I'm looking at this uh, for quote code minimum, what I would do is have one control zone here for primary daylight zone, one control zone for secondary daylight zone. Now, personally, I like to break things up a little more than that. So it may be that somebody is working in here on a Sunday, they don't need all the lights on within this space, maybe they only need the lights over here on. So I would break it down into quadrants here as well. So I, I need a second, I need a specific daylight zone here for, uh, for daylight, primary daylight, one for secondary daylight here, but then I've got this broken down so that I can control these two separately from these two, from these two, from these two, and I'm noting that the vacancy sensor, a B, the vacancy sensor here is controlling this zone and this zone. This vacancy sensor is controlling, um, oh, sorry, I wrote this incorrectly. It should be C and D, um, this zone and this zone, right? So this just gives a little bit more granular control, um, better, happier people potentially, but also more energy savings within that particular space. Um, if we go into the private office, there's no uh, daylight involved in the private office. So we've got a vacancy sensor here, uh, could also be an occupancy sensor. Now this is a good time to talk a little bit about uh, vacancy and occupancy sensors. We talked about them yesterday and the notion that um, a vacancy sensor, you have to push a button in order for the lights to come on, right? Whereas the occupancy sensor, they'll automatically come on. Now, um, it's very convenient for an occupancy sensor. You walk into the space, the lights go on, you don't have to touch anything. That's great. Um, there was a time that um, all of the energy codes, or most of the energy codes, really deprecated the use of occupancy sensors because the theory was that uh, a vacancy sensor would save more energy. Why? Well, if you are walking into somebody's private office, you're just gonna drop a folder on the desk and you're gonna walk back out again, what happens? With an occupancy sensor, the lights come on, the lights stay on, typically in the past for 30 minutes, right? And they may not need to. If you have a vacancy sensor, nothing happens, right? You walk in, you drop the folder off, you walk out, no energy is used, fantastic. Now, that's all terrific, but here's a couple of caveats. Um, the 30 second timeout, right? Uh, I hope you all, many of you I think on here will remember the days of uh, timeouts for occupancy sensors being set to no less than 30 minutes. And there is a misunderstanding, particularly among sort of uh, people that aren't designers, that that 30, se 30 minutes rather uh, was set that way so that it would prevent false triggers. That's not really the case. Um, the biggest issue with respect to a 30 minute timeout was the ubiquitous use of fluorescent tubes, right? So the lamp life on a fluorescent tube is based on the number of hours that it's burned 
plus the number of starts, right? So a, a fluorescent tube has um, tungsten cathodes in each end, right? So um, they're basically just like the filaments that you would have in an incandescent lamp. Every time you turn it on, it sputters off a little bit of that tungsten filament, and that's what coats the inside of the lamp. You'll see uh, fluorescent lamps that have been turned on and off too frequently will get that black sort of, uh, we call it raccoon tailing, around the, the uh, ends of the, the, the lamps there. So um, by turning it on and off more frequently than 30 minutes at a time, that significantly reduced the lamp life. So you were kind of shooting yourself in the foot. You were saving energy, but you were causing uh, more maintenance issues, it became a kind of, kind of balance point. The thing is with LEDs, they don't care. They're turned on and off fully multiple times a second. So I normally tell people that they should probably be doing timeouts in the five to 15 minute range rather than the, the um, 30 minute range. If there are false triggers off for the system, that means that there's a misapplication of the actual sensor. It's either in the wrong place, it's the wrong type, whatever that happens to be, that should be corrected, not, not simply extending the, the timeout. Now, the other interesting thing here, is that there was a study that was done in, uh, if I'm remembering, it's the, the mid-2000s, 2005, 2006 or so. Um, it was done by uh, California Lighting Technology Center, CLTC, Michael Saminovich, running it. And what they were questioning was, uh, is it true? Do you really get maximal savings from vacancy sensors versus occupancy sensors? Well, they kind of did a study. And what they did was set up the, the private office with an automatic on occupancy sensor, but, and here's a big but, it only would ever be allowed to turn the lights on automatically to 50% light output. Now, the theory was if you wanted to have more light, you go ahead and press the button on the, on, uh, the wall and bring it up to full light up. But, but what they found is that a lot of times people didn't bother doing that because they were perfectly happy with the amount of light that they had anyway. If they needed more, they always had access to it. But what they found was that this was actually a really good way to save energy as well. So you'll find that most of the energy codes now have been updated to allow uh, occupancy sensor rather than vacancy sensor in places like offices, schools, and, and other places but only if they automatically go on to 50%. You can't go higher than that. Now that you can press the button and turn it higher if you need it, but that's, that's kind of the, the, the rule there. All right, so that was a pretty big, pretty big um, tangent, but it was hopefully a useful one for everybody. So um, back to the office here, right? We have a vacancy sensor. We have uh, the control zones. Um, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back to that tangent for a second. Uh, anybody who's really interested in that whole 50% thing, go back to the sequence of operations uh, that I showed you yesterday for the private office for the San Francisco Public Utilities Headquarters, and you'll note that in that sequence of operations narrative, there is in fact uh, the note that the, that the um, uh, private offices go automatically to 50% based entirely on that research that Semenovich was doing. Okay, now, uh, where do we go from there? So we come into the team room here, right? Uh, so we have a decorative pendant and we have a wall washer. Those of course are going to be on different control zones so that we can control them independently. There'll be a vacancy sensor in there that will control both of those. And in the conference room, we'll do much the same, right? Uh, we'll have these three decorative pendants on a control zone and one linear control zone for the wall washer. Now, it's also possible some people would prefer to have each one of these on their own control zones or to control these two together separately from this one. However you do that, it's, it's perfectly fine as long as you have at least the two control zones in here. Now, um, you can do daylight sensors that look like this. You can do occupancy sensors on the ceiling that might look like this. You might choose to do wall-mounted occupancy sensors like this, say for the team room or the conference room. Here I've got one showing uh, a wall-mounted vacancy sensor shown here. In the other places, I've got them shown as uh, ceiling-mounted. Also, 
you'll notice that I've annotated this as if it is the uh, very specific uh, room controller methodology that I showed you yesterday in the um, discussion about control zones. We could also have done this with the, the Z uh, nomenclature just as easily. Now, one other thing that you'll find here is that I designate lighting control stations. What does that mean? So a lighting control station or a wall station uh, is basically the human interface device. Colloquially, we think of them as switches or dimmers, right? Or uh, preset uh, recall stations. So they might look like this. One of the things that I do, and, and this may or may not be useful for you, I hope it is, it's been tremendously useful for me over the years, is that I will schedule these things, right? What do I mean by that? So if you look at a common set of plans, you'll find at the door, you'll find uh, something that looks uh, suspiciously like, let's see if I can get a pen here, uh, suspiciously like an S squiggle with a line through it, right? What does that mean? Right? You might find three of them there. Okay, and there might be some other annotation there or something, who knows, right? Um, what does that really tell you? Does that tell you much? Um, you know, if you're buying this system, if you're a contractor procuring this system, if you're a distributor trying to do the takeoff on this system, what does this tell you? Even if you're the designer, what does this tell you, right? Uh, I find a better way to think about this is to go ahead and define uh, types that get used on the project. So what do I mean by that? Type LC1 here is these three devices, right? A two button, what I would call uh, entry or exit station, right? Full on, full off. And a two button station that might be corresponding to this group versus this group that allows me to have on, off, preset, and then raise lower for the specific groups that are there all behind a common faceplate, right? And I might have type LC1 on this project, this office neighborhood might iterate 40 times, right? So I might have 40 iterations of type LC1. I might use this same, uh, the same kind of configuration in other places. So I might have 70, who knows? But I call them all the same thing. Here in the private office, I want to have a multiple level uh, ability within there and raise lower. So I've got something here that's telling me this is a general light level, this is a bright light level. So here's my 50% light output, here's my full light output, here's a dimmed reading level, here's a raise lower. Right? Um, LC3, I'm going to want to have scenes in my team room and my conference room. You'll notice I have them labeled. This is really important. The more you can label wall stations, the happier people are because then they're not walking over to something and guessing what happens if I press this, what happens if I press this, what happens if I press this. This is something that frequently doesn't happen, but it's a really, really good thing to, to kind of go through. All right, so I hope that kind of makes sense. Uh, let me move further to the next one. And as I say, I am scheduling these. What does that look like, right? So I put together a control schedule. This is very similar to a luminaire schedule, right? So you'll wind up having uh, a description. What do you have here? Three single gang wireless network lighting control devices mounted behind a common matching decor style faceplate. And then it defines what the two buttons are. I might define what the catalog numbers are over here, unless I'm just trying to do a um, performance specification, then I might uh, skip the catalog and put in acceptable manufacturers, whatever that happened to be. Um, it's the engraving schedule, right? So you can figure out what the engraving should be. And then I have a variety of notes that might be applied to each one of these particular devices. So this gives me the basic uh, sort of general hardware information that then couples in with the sequence of operations that we talked about the other day, right? So this is the matrix that I showed you, and this is how it might kind of get filled out. So I've got room 101, right? I've got four control zones, A, B, C, and D. That's the open office. It's an open office. There are recessed troffers. In the private office, there are recessed troffers. In the team room, 
suspended indirect and recessed wall washers. I list the target light level for each area. Of course, there's no real target light level for the recessed wall washer, is what it is, right? And then I note what lighting control station is controlling each of these devices, uh, each of these control zones. And then I also note what control strategies are being employed in these specific areas. These zones are controlled by the manual switch, the on-off uh, entry station. They're controlled by dimmer switches, right? The two, the two dimmers with raise lower. Um, they don't have te technically a preset station there, but you can select on that particular thing a preset. I'm not doing time clock or astronomic time clock, but then over here, I'm doing occupancy sensor and or vacancy sensor. What does this mean? So I talked about scheduling yesterday and how I typically use scheduling now predominantly as a means of controlling sensors, right? So in this particular office, say, um, I have occupancy sensor or vacancy sensor up in the ceiling. So do I care whether it's occupancy sensor or vacancy sensor? Well, if I'm really fine tuning the space, what I'm probably gonna do is say, during normal business hours, right, say from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., it's a vacancy sensor, right? That means I have to go over to the wall station that's at the door, turn the lights on, and the lights come on, and then they stay on until um, uh, it's time for the, the either nobody's there or the um, uh, end of day, right? After hours, it turns into an occupancy sensor. Now, there's also one other thing that I've got sort of here. Um, occupancy sensor, vacancy sensor timeout. Well, I've got this to 15 minutes. And then I've also got some notes over here, one of which says that during normal business hours, the occupant, oh, sorry, the vacancy sensor, when it doesn't sense anybody, you, you hit the button, the lights come on. If nobody, if it doesn't sense anybody after 15 minutes, it doesn't turn off. It goes to 20% light output. Why is that? That's because I don't want to annoy people in the space, and I don't want to annoy them enough that they're going to disable the lighting control system, right? I'd rather harvest 80% of the energy and keep everybody happy than harvest 100% of the energy until they get irritated enough to disable the system. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, so that's kind of how that goes. And the reason that I would say vacancy sensor during day, occupancy sensor at night, is very simple. During the day, in the unlikely event that you have a false trigger to off, you've probably got some other light within the space, right? You're not going to be plunged into darkness. You've either got light coming in from um, relights in the doors or from uh, window walls, wherever that happens to come from. So you can get up, you can you can go and hit the, the sensor if you need to. At night, or on a weekend, if you're there alone and you're plunged into darkness, that's unfortunate. You really don't want to be kind of stumbling over to try to find a, a um, uh, try to find a, a switch to turn the lights back on. I hope that makes sense. Uh, some other things that we have here: uh, daylight dimming. Right. So zone A is in daylight dimming. Daylight dimming zone one, zone two, zone one, zone two. Daylight minimum. I also don't like to turn lights off, although a lot of codes do kind of require that now. Um, I prefer to, to dim things down in daylight zones, again, to 20% rather than off, uh, to, to avoid annoying people. Task tuning. Uh, I gave you the task tune uh, information about what your initial light level was and your target light level. So this gives you what the dimming percentage is. Normally speaking, you would do this in the field with a light meter and you would go ahead and uh, check for the, the real measurements. But for the purposes of what we're doing here, this is close enough. Of course, uh, this is an interior, so there's no site uh, stuff. And then these specialty notes. Well, what does this mean? Okay, um, before we go on to that, I'm gonna just show you one other thing before we jump over to there. This is essentially the same kind of documentation just with the uh, Z annotation, right? So this gives you the room-based annotation. This gives you the, the Z1, Z2, Z3 kind of annotation that we talked about yesterday. All right, so some of the sheet notes, right? So the 
schedule here or the matrix re uh, references these sheet notes. What does that mean? Well, those might be sort of very specialty notes. Come up, there we go. Um, that um, um, amplify on the information that you're providing, right? So I might have type LC1 is the same across 30 different rooms, but I might have some specific notes that I want to have associated with each individual LC1, right? So I might have a specific note. Um, LC1 is uh, two buttons, zone A through D, zone A, B, zone C, D, whatever it happens to be, gives me the light levels for those and so forth. Um, I can also have them as typical notes, right? So if there are typical notes that affect the whole project, I would put them here. The specific notes, it doesn't have to be specific to each individual station. I might use this specific note one for 30 out of 45 type LC1s, right? Um, it really just depends on how you're putting it together. And this, of course, is how that would, would look. So again this is a more comprehensive look at how you might do this kind of sequence of operations information you can also again do it as the narrative as i showed you yesterday um, and again just to remind you the reason i would do it this way is specifically because i want to have the the uh, information uh, persistence right i want to be able to have maintenance people five years from now pull out a set of plans and have this information on the actual you know, e-size sheets rather than trying to fumble around and try to find a spec book that they're probably already lost, right? All right, so any questions on the LLLC, oh, sorry, on the NLC method? Okay, not seeing any, I'm gonna push forward. So the other way I might consider this is with the luminaire level lighting controls, right? So if we think back again, this is with the idea that we would have a comprehensive sort of system, right? Where we would have the dimming driver and the logic and the zone controller and the sensors all in each one of these light fixtures, right? So the idea would be that each one becomes its own control zone. We don't have to worry about um, adding additional sensors, occupancy or daylight sensors. We don't have to worry about pairing up additional occupancy sensors or daylight sensors. So um, a couple of things about this. Um, one, it does add a, a small amount of cost to the light fixture. Uh, but it is a really, really simple and elegant way to bring lighting controls to a project, particularly um, if you are doing a project where uh, you don't know a lot about lighting controls, you don't have a lighting controls expert involved. Um, the pre-programming of these things right out of the box in most cases gets you about 75% of the way there, uh, and then you can do some fine tuning. Uh, from an installation standpoint, everything comes from the factory. So all you really have to do is throw them up in the ceiling, add a hot neutral and a ground, and you're off to the races. You know, at that point, then the only thing you really have to do is pair the the um, fixtures to the wall stations to, 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 to tell them which ones to communicate with which. And it's, it's really simple. Um, the other real benefit here is that um, from an energy code standpoint, you automatically meet basically every energy code I'm aware of, right? And most energy codes offer you a prescriptive path to compliance. So instead of having to do the exhaustive energy code documentation that you would for a relic for a, a uh, an actual um, NLC system, you can go ahead and uh, check a box. I, I'm LLC, LLLC. I'm done. Now, one key thing there is that LLLCs are a subset of NLC, right? Uh, it used to be that these would be separate systems. Uh, in fact, we used to call them vertically integrated luminaire systems. Uh, and it was cumbersome because you would have, you know, your your down lights or your, your um, general troughers or up lights, whatever, uh, as one system. And then you would have everything else as a separate lighting control system. So people would have to get used to two systems, figure out two systems, whatever. Today, uh, these systems all work really, really well together. 
So the decorative and wall wash fixtures in here that don't actually have an opportunity to have the sensor mounted to them, basically work, you retain the vacancy sensors here and you retain, if you had daylight in here, you'd retain a daylight sensor. But you keep the primary light fixtures as LLLC and it all works together with one system, one set of, of wall stations, um, one set of programming apps, all those things, right? So again, uh, each one would have its own individual control, right? A, B, C, D, E, well, sorry, E, F, G, H, and so forth. Um, and everything else really basically is handled more or less the same. So if we came to the sequence of operations here, uh, you'll note that I have added the individual other control zones here. Um, I might also say that a shorthand way to do this would be to type in uh, control zone A through H or um, put in the ones that um, are in the primary daylight zone A through, let's say A through D and then E through H. So that um, that simplifies documentation a little bit if you want to. But look at these these this information. It's really basically all the same thing, right? Um, this gives you all the information that you would really need to have the system um, set up, programmed, uh, commissioned, all those things. This is what the, the larger version of that might look like. Okay. So are there any questions about either of these? Uh, if we were meeting in person, which someday, hopefully again, we will, um, we would be starting to look at programming this kind of implementation on the control board examples that I showed you yesterday, right? So when we get a chance to meet together, I would encourage all of you to come back to another version of this class when we do the hands-on so that you can actually go ahead and get start the programming. You can, you can wire up the devices, you can do the programming, you can set up an entire tech office uh, space here. Um, very frequently I hear from people that, oh my gosh, I don't want to do these systems because they're so complicated. Honestly, starting from zero, it would take you about 10 minutes, if that, to program all of the lighting controls in this space right, that we're looking at here. So it's, it's a real eye-opening kind of thing. Um, we'll talk about uh, moving forward, the parts, the pieces, how they program all that stuff, but take as written that please come, please come to one of the, um, the hands-on classes when, when we can. At the very least, um, I'll be doing the two-day version of this class, which offers much more in-depth information about, in particular, specifications, sequence of operations, hardware, all those things uh, at Light Fair in October in New York, if you're gonna be there. Okay, uh, so it is time for yet another one of our fabulous, and I do mean fabulous, pop quizzes. So where did I put the polls? There they are. So um, this is your time to shine. Why is it critical to provide a sequence of operations and specifications? Is it to maximize the benefits of lighting control systems? To maximize energy savings? Mm, to simplify installation and setup and commissioning so that everyone can get off the job faster and move on? Or is it to reduce callbacks and problems for everybody? Do, 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 do. This will be our, our Alex Trebek uh, tribute moment. Also an excellent moment for me to mute my mic and finish my coffee. So most of you have voted. So let us go ahead and close this and see what we all think. So why is it critical to provide a sequence of operations? So to maximize the benefits, yes, indeed. To maximize energy savings, also a valid answer. To simplify installation setup and commissioning, also a valid answer. Uh, note that installation setup and commissioning are three separate things, although we in the lighting industry speak sort of sloppily and say commissioning when what we really mean is setup. 
so that everyone can get off the job faster and move on. Oddly enough, nobody picked that, but it actually is a valid uh, reason as well. Um, we're all, all of us, whether we're, we're in distribution, sales, design, uh, installation, uh, whatever our role is, um, you know, we're all we're all paid by the project, right? So having a sequence of operations, it takes a little bit of time up front, but it saves a huge amount of time of later. So that again, we can all essentially get the job done, get it done well, move on, and absolutely to reduce callbacks and problems, right? Um, now, somebody in one of these classes a couple of years ago uh, who uh, was on the design sort of side said that, well, you know, reducing callbacks and problems, that's not my problem. And, and I would say absolutely not. Reducing callbacks and problems is, is an issue for everybody. Architects, engineers, distributors, uh, reps, everybody. We want to make these projects happen as quickly and as simply and as efficiently as possible because otherwise it's gonna impact all of us, right? So, um, please take the time to really think this through up front and, uh, and put it together. All right, so let me jump off of that soapbox for a moment. And I'm gonna, again, encourage you, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. I'm not seeing anybody at the moment. Okay. All right, um, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I hope that gave you a little bit of a sense of how I would think about implementing controls for um, that project. Now, it's important to remember once again, there's no right answer, right? How I would implement it doesn't necessarily have to be how you would implement it, as long as at the very least, we've thought about it, it's going to work effectively for the people who are using it, and it meets energy code, right? Now, I mentioned at the very beginning yesterday that meeting energy code really is not a good metric of of, of quality lighting controls um, because it's literally the least you can do, right? But let's think about this for just a couple of moments. What are some of the highlights? Now, if you are looking for real specifics, particularly about the new 2018 version of the Seattle Energy Code, please go ahead and hit the Lighting Design Lab webpage, go to our recorded classes. And as I mentioned yesterday, we have a series of energy code updates that are recorded there and you can find the specifics. I'm gonna talk very generally about uh, energy, uh, energy code with respect to lighting controls here, uh, partly because we also have a national audience. We have, we have a number of people who are not in the Pacific Northwest. So there are commonalities to energy codes, whether we're talking about the Seattle Energy Code, um, IECC, International Energy Conservation Code, which is, currently in the Northwest anyway, in effect in Washington, Idaho, uh, Montana. Oregon currently has its own specialty uh, efficiency code, although uh, the theory is that in the next few years, they're also going to unify into the IECC. And of course, California does its, its own thing. Um, those of you who are not from Seattle will not sort of necessarily know. Um, Seattle, for as long as I've been a lighting designer, um, has had actually the most progressive, restrictive, however you want to phrase it, energy code in the country. Uh, California always gets kind of the the, uh, the press because they're the fifth largest economy on the planet. So there's a certain amount of, of rationality there. So wh whether we're talking about an energy code here in the US or SIBSI in, in uh, England or Estadamo or Pearl in the Middle East or China, basically the idea is the same turn the lights off or at least dim them down when you don't need them, right? When you don't have to have the lights burning, it makes the most sense to not have the lights burning, right? So we've talked about occupancy and vacancy sensors. Those are required in most areas. Um, it used to be that we would have a very small subset of areas that would require occupancy sensors, right? Private offices, toilet rooms, janitors, places like that. Now, most areas, corridors, stairwells, open plan offices, conference rooms, we tend to want to use occupancy or vacancy sensors in most areas. Um, absolutely in spaces, say 300 square feet or less, and basically all places that, that are enclosed by uh, ceiling height partitions that don't, that don't have some reason not to use them. Like, for example, 
a an electrical closet, right? Uh, an electrical or mechanical closet. I don't know how many of you, I'd, I'd sort of ask you to raise your hands if I could, but how many of us have had their hands next to an energized bus bar? No. Gosh, I have to get used to this camera. Um, I have. Uh, and I can tell you firsthand, uh, if my hand is, is 10 inches from an electrified bus bar, I don't want the lights going off at that time. So that's going to be the only place I ever tell you, don't ever use any kind of lighting controls. Toggle switch with a lockout, right? Turn the lights on. If the lights stay on, that's okay. All right, so uh, turn the lights off with occupancy sensors when they're not needed. Scheduling, right? Schedule the light only when needed. So I mentioned that um, time of day scheduling is not as common as it once was. It used to be the key thing, right, that we would have uh, lights come on at a certain time, lights would go off at a certain time, then we would have after hour sweeps that we would have to go over and press buttons. We tend not to do that so much anymore except maybe in places like lobbies. Um, there are some areas, atria, let's say retail establishments where we, we may want to have scheduling rather than sensing. But for the most part, I tend to use scheduling for, as I mentioned, uh, playing with the fine tuning of the sensors. Now, one thing about this, most, uh, most uh, uh, energy codes now actually have specific requirements about um, how many kinds of events there might be, multiple calendars, different daylight events. It used to be that you would just have a simple Torx or Intermatic time clock that would turn the lights on at a certain time, turn the lights off at a certain time. Um, that normally doesn't really cut it anymore. It needs to be some kind of electronic device. Manual control. Uh, almost everywhere um, that you have a, um, any kind of lighting control, um, you need to have the ability to turn the lights off. So you need to have a switch, right? And I would pause it. If you're gonna have a switch, you should have a switch that has a raise lower, has a dimmer on it so that you can bring the lights up or down. Now, um, you're gonna find this in places like classrooms, in workrooms, uh, offices, some corridors. Although most of the time in corridors, you don't actually need to have uh, manual control, certainly not in um, places like stairwells, egress paths, things like that, uh, parking garages. So the idea is that um, employ a bit of common sense. Um, if there's ever a time that people are gonna need to be able to turn the lights off, you're gonna need to have a switch in there somewhere, right? Um, but again, stairwells and corridors, now, um, stairwells, we've been doing luminaire level lighting controls in them for a number of years now, right? We would, we would stick a uh, fluorescent fixture up on the wall that would have uh, occupancy and or daylight sensors. Well, now, of course, we're doing that with LED, um, but it's required in most codes now that we be able to uh, extinguish the power by at least 50%. Um, I would actually, personally, I'd get down to 20% because once you've got a little bit of light in there, that's enough in order to be able to see when you open the door. As soon as you open the door, it bounces up to full full brightness. So um, if you're more comfortable with 50%, that's fine, not a problem. Uh, it just maximizes the savings if you get down to 20. Um, lighting, uh, parking garages also. Parking garages are, are one of the most excellent places there are for luminaire level lighting controls because adding in wireless controls to sensors or adding wi adding wireless controls to sensors is problematic because you've got a lot of mass, you've got a lot of steel that really cuts down on the transmission of uh, wireless signals. Wired is problematic because you have either embedded um, conduits within the concrete if you're starting from scratch or you have to do surface conduit in order to run uh, control wires, that's crazy. So the better approach is to put everything into each light fixture, let it be its own individual control zone, um, put it up, all you have to have then is hot, neutral, and ground, really, really, really simplifies things, right? Um, and most of these things are dimmable now as well. So you just kind of set them up with, with your programming, life is good, I hope that makes sense. Okay, um, daylighting controls, right? So. Uh, no, no magic here, 
uh, when there's enough daylight available, reduce the, the light level. Uh, dim or a lot of energy codes uh, will tell you to turn that you have to turn the lights off. Um, I, I find that if you discuss it with the particular code official, um, you, you may be able to get them to give you a variance and say dim it to 20 or 10 instead of off. Um, it's long been my experience that turning things off irritates people. I gave you the example yesterday of fiddling with the uh, knobs in the bar uh, and how that would affect productivity. I could also tell you that the very first daylighting project that I designed that I worked on uh, was a multi-building corporate campus in, uh, just outside of Portland, Maine. Um, several story buildings uh, with uh, the then uh, newfangled um, uh, electronic T8 um, uh, ballasts with uh, uh, parabolic 2x4 light fixtures. So uh, we had advised them, I was working with Honeywell at the time, we'd advised them that it was gonna work better if we did dimming instead of switching, but they didn't wanna spend the money to update to the newfangled uh, Advanced Mark 7 dimming ballast, so that's fine. So we use what we call a threshold switching system. What that means is that when the perimeter uh, areas were receiving enough daylight, uh, and that was generally assumed to be uh, two to three times the target light level. So to put that in perspective, if our target was say 50 foot candles for round numbers, the lights would stay on until it was 100 or 150 foot candles measured at the thing, and then they would turn off. The problem was that when something like that happens, the lights turn off, you notice it, right? Something happens you're working on a spreadsheet, you're writing something, you're reading something, whatever. You look up, something happened, what happened? That negatively affects productivity and irritates people. If you're slowly dimming down to 20% light output, nothing is noticeable, nobody changes that, and it's all good, right? So, um, David is posting something about audio. Katie, can you hear me? I can hear you and it, it you sound fine. So, um, okay. oh good, oh good, good. Okay. It's back. Good enough. Okay, um, so for what that's worth. Um, uh, oh, the, so the, 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 the place in Maine, uh, to make a very long story short, uh, I got a call from the, uh, one of the real estate people up there and Basically, this, this fellow told me that the lighting control system wasn't working, uh, that I had to come back up to Maine from Boston and either fix it or take it out. Um, I was a relatively young designer at the time. I was, frankly, very nervous about what, what I was going to find. What I found was um, some of you will remember the days of corporate America where it was just common practice that in every restroom there was, there was a little Dixie cup dispenser. So somebody sent a signal that they didn't like the lighting controls because they literally taped a Dixie cup over each one of the sensors. So yes, it wasn't working at all. The, the, this, uh, the lighting controls were never turning off. So I walked part of the campus with this, this uh, person and said, well, your problem isn't the lighting control system. Your problem is the people. We'll talk about this more in just a couple of moments, but um, somebody or some buddies were really irritated by this system because it was causing calling attention to itself okay enough said um now when you're defining daylight control zones uh there are some differences depending on code generally speaking from side light which is windows window fenestration you're essentially coming in um the window height uh, of the window wall into the space is your primary daylight zone and then your secondary daylight zone. And then you actually define uh, how far it goes uh, away from the window uh, according to a variety of different graphics. Some are more, some are less. We used to think of it as actually a 45 degree that this would all be daylight zone, but it turns out that that really doesn't work. Similar graphics are available for uh, overhead lighting. Uh, and again, we used to think of this notion as 45 degrees, but that really doesn't work. So uh, I'm not gonna go through these because there are pretty self-explanatory graphics in basically every code. Um, I will tell you that um, I, I don't care how many codes you've actually dealt with. 
every single time I do a project, I go ahead and reference the code that's in effect in the particular jurisdiction, and I look at it. I don't trust my own memory because things might have changed, who knows? Uh, it's just not worth it. Check every time. Okay. 24-hour uh, lighting. It used to be that we would have these circuits that we would have lights on 24 hours a day, right? Emergency lighting. And we would think of this as 24-hour circuits, constant hot, sometimes egress lighting, although it's not really technically true. Um, but the reality is that that's no longer allowed. So this is a good example. This is the Spokane Public Library. Hopefully this has been corrected since then. This was actually a photograph from 2002. Um, so you're seeing uh, indirect fluorescent there in a pretty well daylighted space, actually. The, the photograph doesn't really tell you how well daylighted it is. But um, you see that kind of the up lights there, it's not possible to turn those off, which is really unfortunate. Um, today, you have to control everything, right? So if that's an emergency circuit, that's great. It can be fed by an emergency circuit, but it still needs to be dimmable along with everything else. So different systems handle this in different ways, right? We can go ahead and have um, battery backup in the light fixtures. We can have battery inverters. We might have generators or a variety of different ways to do that. If we have an alternate, an alternate emergency source, right, either from an inverter or from a generator, we might want to use something called uh, UL924 relays or devices. Now, um, this is an example, again, of, of um, one of the, the teaching devices that I put together for this class. So what we have here are two control zones that are representing a uh, corridor, right? So we have this, uh, these light fixtures in the corridor, these are the ones that are on the emergency power feed. These are the normal power feed, right? So they function together. Um, you'll notice that we have one of the load controllers that we've been, we've been talking about here. Uh, could be anybody's load controllers. Some manufacturers, the load controllers themselves are actually UL924 devices. In some cases, we need to add on separate what we call UL924 shunt relays. So let's see how that might work. So I am using my remote switch here, you know, my wireless switch. I just turned on all the corridor lighting. Now I'm going to turn off all the corridor lighting. So I have power coming from the normal load center, power coming from the emergency center here. Now you'll see that I can dim, even though they're, they're being uh, connected to different devices, I can dim them up and I can dim them down the same way. So they're controllable the same. What happens if I lose normal power? Well, part of the UL924 requirement is to drive the light source to full light output until the normal feed is re uh, restored, at which point then they become controllable again. And you'll notice that it went to the uh, uh, it went to the the light level that it had been at before, right? So this is one of the ways that, that we wind up doing this emergency lighting in order to make sure that things are functioning together. Again, sometimes you'll use a specific uh, shunt relay. Sometimes the devices themselves are UL924 rated. Uh, about half of the NLC manufacturers uh, are set up that way at the moment. There's a question here, where is UL924 mandatory? Um, I don't know that UL924 itself is mandatory <coughs> anywhere except that uh, it's, it, it is a way to, to compliance. Um, what is mandatory is the ability to essentially turn the lights on and turn, turn the lights off. So whether you're going ahead and doing that with um, a more comprehensive lighting control system or you're doing that with um, um, luminaires that have battery backups so that they're normally, they're, they're basically being controlled by the normal lighting control system except when power when it senses that there's no power then the battery kicks in and takes over um, i don't know that there's that there's a specific requirement anywhere okay so that'll give you some sense of how you can do some of that stuff um, this is uh, 
an example of using uh, the load controller itself, right? So this comes back to that uh, display board that I showed you earlier, right? Where we have, uh, you'll notice our open plan office area, our private office, our conference rooms. And this is what we would program if we were all sort of meeting together. We would we would install the the uh, load controllers. We would tie them in with the uh, uh, five wires, right? A hot neutral ground, and then two low voltage wires for the zero to ten volt control. And then we would program them up to match up to the wall stations, right? Uh, and other devices, all that stuff. In this particular case, you'll note that this one's red. This particular device is specifically meant to be a UL924 device. So it doesn't require that specific um, um, relay, shunt relay. So that would work very much like this, right? So again, I can turn everything on, turn everything off, dim it up, dim it down. However, if I go ahead and lose power, like that, you'll notice, and I lost power and then I restored it, you'll notice that this went to full light output, right? The rest of these went back to where they, where they were. This went back to full light, full light output. Uh, apologies, if, if this had actually been properly fed by a different circuit, by the way, by an emergency feed circuit, it never would have gone out at all. But uh, I don't have it set up that way in the, the demonstration. But you'll notice that, that there is a certain period of time that in this particular system, that this remains, even after power has been restored, this remains uh, uncontrollable. Eventually, um, I think it's 10 minutes maybe, uh, it will become controllable again. Right? So there are a couple of different ways that you can go ahead and do this. Okay, um, exterior lighting. So exterior lighting, um, we've long had the, the requirement that you can turn the lights off and you can turn the lights on right, at various times. Um, energy codes are more and more coming up with the notion that we're gonna need to be doing things like occupancy sensing for pedestrian uh, lighting for parking lots, uh, potentially dimming. In fact, most exterior light fixtures now are dimmable and there's no reason not to be dimming them, right? Rather than rather than switching them on and off. Um, and there are a lot of specific things we might require. Uh, for example, projects I've done in California, uh, I need to pay attention to things like migratory bird patterns and set up programming so that during migration seasons, the exterior lighting dims way back. Right? Um, but all these things are coming. Um, we don't necessarily require yet to have the, uh, the the occupancy sensing in most areas, but it is coming. Uh, and the good news is that the control systems are rapidly getting better with exterior occupancy sensors. So this will be very useful for us. But you certainly will have to do things like um, turn lights on, turn lights off, dim things down at specific, at specific times. And it's gonna be different according to each code. Another big one is receptacles, right? So uh, one of the big energy users in buildings is, of course, uh, plug loads, right? Um, we think of these as vampire loads. Um, so for example, things like, um, well, if you're, a, if you're a, a design firm, you might have a plotter that is uh, always kind of on, or you might have task lights, or you might have your monitor, or you might have uh, the big, big, big one is laser printers, right? Uh, there's a lot of energy involved in keeping the platens on the laser printer warm so that they can, they can start up quickly. So overnight, there's no real reason to be doing those things. So uh, one of the requirements in most of these codes now is that 50% of all outlets be controlled and they'd be labeled as controlled. If, if you sort of zoomed in here or you saw this, it shows that, that the things are controlled. Now there's a couple of ways that you can do this, right? You can do that with, with uh, relay modules that are essentially 20 amp versions of the load controllers that we've been looking at, it would look like this, but a 20 amp version. Or a number of manufacturers are also to have developed these smart receptacles. So the idea is that you have, in these, in these devices, you have radio frequency uh, transceivers and receivers, right? It tells you to go on, go off, go up and down. You have the same kind of thing in these receptacles. So that, um, in other words, all you have to do is, if you, particularly if you have existing receptacles, 
you don't have to rewire anything. Just go ahead, uh, add the, the sensors into the, the existing system, and then do the programming to tie them together. Right? Very simple. It looks a little bit like this. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the lights on. You'll notice that the occupancy sensor, uh, sorry, the, the um, smart receptacle, which is actually also controlling this, turns on and turns off with that. It will do the same thing with scheduling. If I have scheduling set up, it will also do the same thing with occupancy or vacancy sensors. The key thing here is, and the reason that some of these things got a little bit of a bad rap, is that people were plugging in their computers into them, their CPUs. Don't plug in the CPUs. It's very clearly labeled what is what. Don't plug the CPU in there and you'll be fantastic. Okay. Uh, let's see. Commissioning. So I'd mentioned that uh, commissioning is, is uh, not what we normally call it. So a commissioning agent actually called me out on this some years ago for sloppy language during one of these classes, in fact, and she was absolutely correct. Um, I was using language the same way that a lot of the rest of the industry uses and sometimes still do. Uh, we talk about commissioning lighting control systems when what we really mean is startup and programming. Commissioning itself is actually a third party process of measurement and verification, functional testing and reporting to make sure that the system as installed is functioning the way that the sequence of operations says it's supposed to be installed. Right? This is nothing new to our friends in the HVAC world. They've been doing this for many years, but it is relatively newer for lighting and it is required in more and more energy codes, including the International Energy Conservation Code. So whether it's being required specifically in a current jurisdiction or not is up for debate. However, I would tell you as a designer or an installer or a salesperson, you pretty much have to assume that the code is the code, right? Uh, it may be that, that the inspector in Timbuk3 is not requiring commissioning today, but that may not be the case three weeks from now and the uh, system that you sold a month ago, you have to pay attention to these things, right? So. Uh, the good news is that the IES has a really good design guide that really goes through this process. It has an interesting flowchart that talks about how to do commissioning at basically all levels, starting from the initial concept design all the way through post-occupancy evaluation and verification. So um, take a look at this, at this document. It's really, really good. Um, LLCs, we've talked about luminaire level lighting controls, right? Uh, it's really important that to recognize that if you need to really simplify your documentation, LLCs are a great reason to do that for uh, code compliance, right? Because automatically they're accepted in almost every jurisdiction. And the reason isn't because anybody's trying to pull a fast one or sell LLCs or any of that kind of good stuff. It's because they automatically have basically all of the building blocks of everything that you would need inherently set up in them, plus some level of uh, programming already set up. So they're a great option to go ahead and do that. Uh, on the Lighting Design Lab webpage, in fact, we have a, uh, some videos about LLCs if you're curious about more of them. And we also have uh, some design guides with respect to network lighting controls and LLC right, for some of those things. Okay. Um, one thing about commissioning, uh, and this is sort of also sloppy language, but it's, it's intentionally sloppy language, is commissioning the occupants, right? This is not part of an energy code, but it is something that really you should be doing as, as a matter of course. Um, Tell the occupants what the systems are supposed to do. Put together a one-page sheet, uh, particularly for places like schools or open plan offices, things like that. Let people know what is going to happen. This is one of the things that we actually did on that project in Maine where they put Dixie cups over the sensors. We actually put together some um, sheets right, to tell them what, what to expect. And we also had a couple of workshops where I had a light meter and I showed them that we weren't taking anything away from them, right? This is your target light level. Nothing is happening with the lighting until we're at multiples of that. 
And even when we turn the lights off, you still have more light than you actually need. So doesn't really make up for the fact that it has that negative productivity impact of something visually happening, but it does help. So uh, commission the occupants. All right, so that's really kind of a quick overview of energy codes. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, moving forward. Uh, I'm gonna give you a quick case study. Um, this is a quick case study of uh, my own offices right, before I came back to the lighting design lab. So some of you may recognize this building. This is the Bullet Center uh, up on Capitol Hill. It is and has been for a good while now tout, been touted as, as the most uh, advanced or most uh, energy efficient and, and forward thinking office building on the planet. Uh, you'll notice that um, uh, it has that big top hat there, that's uh, photovoltaics. Um, it has big windows with with exterior shading, all kinds of different things going on here. Think about this as um, a place that has zero net anything you can name. It generates more electricity than it uses on an annual basis. It, it, it's its own um, water district, right? The, uh, the water is actually harvested and treated from the roof. So that, uh, I don't believe at this point it's even connected to the city of Seattle public utilities water source. Um, same with um, uh, same with sewage. It's not connected to the sewage system. That the, the uh, uh, all of the sewage is composted. Uh, a lot of different things here. It has uh, ground source uh, uh, heat recovery. All kinds of cool cool stuff here. So um, we'll talk about my offices, which was about 6,100 square feet, relatively small project. Uh, it's basically this floor here, the third floor of the space. We completed it in 2017. Whoops, it's not going to work if I don't press the right place. There we go. So uh, the lighting design, um, fairly simple, right? Uh, super high performance uh, LED light fixtures. Um, somewhat unsurprisingly in a, in a building like this. Uh, and we were at a uh, connected load of about 0.55 watts per square foot, uh, which is good, not phenomenal, but good. But that was with the idea that we would be doing things like task tuning, bringing the light level down so that we would be under driving the light fixtures, extending the life of them, right? So this was part of the initial plan. And we had all the controls, uh, um, strategies that you might want to have in here, including we had the the um, control zoning done in such a way that we would have pretty fine granular control. Right? It was actually a really good good, good setup. Uh, we were using the system that the uh, building owners required us to use. Okay, that's fine. So the problem is that I made a cardinal error. I went away on my three-week vacation right while this was being installed. I went away, everything was good. I came back, the first words out of my principal's mouth was your lighting system isn't working. What do you mean my lighting system isn't working? Turns out that um, while I was gone, uh, a VE was proposed and accepted a value engineering. Now, for those of you who are not aware of the fact, the words value engineering, except when they are done as part of the design phase. If they're in the design phase, they're, it's value engineering. If it happens after the design phase, value engineering is an oxymoron. So uh, they cheapened everything. They theoretically met energy codes, sort of not really. Uh, and ultimately, it wasn't possible to turn the lights off, right? If you tried to turn the lights off, it, we went from a bunch of control zones to basically three control zones. So all of the lights that you see in this image were all in one control zone. And if you turned that off, the two light fixtures that you see that are on there would automatically come on from some kind of bizarre emergency sort of system. Um, it was really, really special when uh, you know world-class tours were coming through and the uh, chairman of the Bullock Foundation, Dennis Hayes, one of the two people who legitimately claim, can claim to have started Earth Day, would come to my desk and say, you know, this is the most advanced office building in the world. Why are the lights on when there's plenty of daylight? And I would have to say to him, Dennis, go talk to you know my then principal. So uh, long story short, um, we lived with this for about a year. 
And then we were approached by a controls manufacturer to potentially be a beta test site for uh, one of their new systems, right? Uh, which is basically an extension of an older system. So uh, this particular manufacturer was Lutron. Uh, now I'm gonna be really candid here and say I'm not promoting Lutron here. Um, we do this class in person with uh, up to eight different manufacturers gear. Any one of those eight manufacturers would be able to do everything that we're talking about here just as effectively. So it's really more about the concepts than the, than the gear itself. So what we did is essentially ripped out the controls that, that had been BE and put in there. And over a very short period of time, um, we did the controls with this whole wireless approach and networked lighting controls. So uh, you'll notice, uh, I don't know if you can see it, we put in a uh, load controller at each one of the light fixtures. So each fixture became its own control zone, which actually gave us more uh, granular control than we originally had. We we'd originally had them in, in pairs, uh, which is good. And um, then we added in a bunch of uh, occupancy sensors and then a bunch of daylight sensors and um, wireless wall switches, including a hub, which was how we program all this stuff together. And we were able to then go ahead and actually turn the lights off. The daylight harvesting worked, the task tuning worked. I was able to, uh, instead of having the lights at full brightness all the time, in which they were actually fairly glary, um, I was able to dim them down to the light level that I had planned in the first place so that they became very comfortable and were, again, harvesting a significant amount of energy. Right? All these things were great. It's kind of, this is not really an LLC system, but it was more or less the same kind of idea. And again, the best part was that, you know, we could turn the lights off and we could dim them. This was a true epiphany. We could turn our lights off. Woo! -hoo! This was fantastic. So at the end of the day, the task tuning right up front was about 25%. So right off the top, we were saving 25% of the energy. We had fully day functioning daylight and we had vacancy sensing. So we set it up so that contiguous rows would talk to each other, right? So Mitria is down here working on billing on a Sunday afternoon and she's got two rows of lights going because she's there. You can't see the, the other row that's near Tony here, but it's right over here. So Tony is also working on a Sunday afternoon. And he's got two lights. Before we did this change, all of the lights on this entire side would be burning at full brightness. So ultimately over time, and we have the data to back this up, effectively we saved more than 70% energy here, right? Effectively annualized, it's about 0.15 watts per square foot instead of the uh, 0.55. And the cost, we didn't pay for this, of course, full disclosure, because this was a beta test site, but at retail, all of the parts and pieces we, we bought would cost about $4,500. So about 0.78 cents per square foot for what five or 10 years ago would have been top flight lighting controls capability, right? Five or 10 years ago, we would have expected to pay three or 350 a square foot for the kind of controls that we have here. This is a retail cost. This is not a project-based cost. If I was doing this on a project base, I would expect this to actually be down somewhere around 50 cents a square foot, right? This is critical, right? Uh, we keep hearing that lighting controls is too expensive. It's not. Right? Anyway, all right, so that's my pop quiz. Um, I, sorry, that's my, my um, case study. Uh, I could show you a couple of others that are very similar. Uh, I did almost the exact same thing with almost the exact same results at Miller Hull's offices here in town, Miller Hull uh, uh, architecture firm. But um, suffice to say, we, we don't have time to kind of zing through that. So let's hit another pop quiz briefly. What are the code implications of using LLLC? Are they simplified code documentation? Are they guaranteed to meet code? Are they simplified installation and setup? Uh, many utilities offer rebates or they offer some functionality out of the box. What do we think?
All right, so let me close this poll since most of you have voted. And share the results. So um, a strong showing for simplified code documentation. That's a great reason and guaranteed to meet code. Those are both great reasons. Um, it is true that um, they can offer also simplified installation setup. Um, one of the things we haven't talked a lot about, we, we mentioned it briefly, is that most utilities, at least in the Pacific Northwest, but I know that some in the Northeast are as well, and I'm sure others, um, utilities are realizing that network lighting controls are the next big thing with respect to being able to do energy savings for their demand side management uh, projects. So a lot of utilities are offering rebates. For example, City of Seattle, Seattle City Light, offers $50 per light fixture uh, for retrofit projects with network lighting controls or LLC light fixtures. Puget Sound Energy, for example, is uh, offering actually $75 per fixture, but it has to be per LLC fixture. They don't allow network lighting controls. Um, and the other part, they offer some functionality of the box. It's actually true. Um, if you have a project where you know you're not going to have time to 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 set it up, you're not going to have uh, people who really know how to set things up. Um, they actually come with some level of functionality for occupancy and uh, daylight control, so uh, they can really um, uh, be useful in that regard. Okay, let's close that. Move forward. Very well done. Thank you very much. All right, let's talk a little bit about the parts and pieces of these control systems, right? Um, now, again, we, we're kind of looking specifically at the mid-range of equipment here, right? It's not the, the sort of very, very simple parts and pieces. It's not the very high-end um, control systems with computer servers and all that kind of good stuff. This is the sweet spot in the middle. Now, the strategies, the, the um, fundamentals of controls and the rationales for using them are all the same, right? Whether we're talking about this little mid-level system parts and pieces approach or up into the stratospheric level of the, the super complicated control systems. It, it really goes up and down, right? You can, you can apply the same, the same logic to each of these. The benefit of these systems that we use for this particular class is that they are the relatively inexpensive parts and pieces approach, and they are almost all programmed with devices that look an awful lot like this, right? Like my phone. So, um, Let's really go through some of them and see what we've got here. So these are the manufacturers that we typically use for these classes. We do them on a rotating basis, right? So if we were doing hands-on programming, we might be looking at Enlight Air and Odyssey or Wavelinks and Smartcast or Zoom and Encelia Manage. If we were doing the two-day class, like the one I'll be doing at Light Fair in October, uh, we would actually program four different manufacturer systems, right? So that gives you some sense. And the good news is that every single one of these systems, while they have their differences, they program differently, from a parts and pieces standpoint, they're very similar and they all work well, right? We're no longer in the days of, of specifying something and hoping for the best. Okay, so, uh, where are we? Okay, so let's see some of the parts and pieces. So Acuity's and light air system consists of luminaires. They're predominantly an LLLC system, although not entirely. They also have um, load controllers that can, can go to other, other fixtures, but uh, they're predominantly uh, an LLLC system. So you have light fixtures with controllers and then you have wall switches and devices that communicate wirelessly with a smart app and they get programmed that way. Okay, so that's one way to think about this. Odyssey is a very different kind of approach, right? They have, let's see, um, load controllers, and um, this is in fact a um, um, an outlet controller with sensors and wall switches controlled by a programming hub where you communicate wirelessly to everything. Okay, well, that's a different way to think about it. Cooper Wavelengths has, oh, look at that. Um, devices, right, 
load controllers and integrated uh, LLC sensors and standalone sensors and smart receptacles that all communicate wirelessly with a control hub and that gets programmed by a hmm, smart app. Huh. Now, Cree is a little bit different. Cree has LLC light fixtures or load controllers that communicate wirelessly with onboard sensors or outboard sensors with switches. And in this case, the programming app is actually a, um, a remote control unit. Press draw and zoom. Oh, look, they have wireless switches and an app and sensors and load controllers. And Encelium has sensors, a load controller, switches, all these kinds of things. ETC Echoflex. Oh, look, it looks like a lot of the same parts and pieces, right? Lutron Vive. Oh, look, load controllers, a central programming hub, a bit of software that we use to go ahead and program. As it turns out, as I've been kind of mentioning, the commonalities really, really come together on these things, right? There's only so many ways that you can do the same thing at the same level and the same price point in order to be able to accomplish the same goals. In fact, most of the differences of these systems have to do with the programming apps themselves and how they uh, implement them. But the, the, the functionality, some have a little bit more functionality in some areas, some have a little bit less functionality, some are a little bit more complicated, some are a little bit less complicated, but honestly, the base functionality is pretty similar. Right? Okay, so how do we start here? Well, we've got communication hubs, right? These are devices that uh, you communicate with your programming app most commonly uh, with via Wi-Fi, and then they communicate wirelessly to their devices by Zigbee or Bluetooth or some proprietary signal mesh. Um, however that happens to be, you're typically going to need one of these, um, you know, in, in a certain square footage range. I think, let's say, I'm thinking off the top of my head, but let's say probably one of them every 10,000 square feet or something. Some systems require these hubs to function, some systems do not. Um, some systems um, you can actually program from them, but you won't need them to function. There are a lot of different different ways that can be done. They're all going to have some flavor of load controller, right? The load controller is the device that actually tells the driver dim up, dim down. It also usually has a relay in it so that it can hard shut things off or turn things on. So the communication protocol, we talked about those yesterday, remember, might be zero to 10 volts, might be two or three wire, which are, are sort of common Lutron ways to think about it, or it might be some kind of digital bus, right? It might be Dolly, or it might be some proprietary digital signal. Um, LLC fixtures, again, as we've been talking about, kind of wrap all this stuff together into, um, into one. Now, there are some manufacturers that are that are integrated, right? They make the fixture and the sensor, and it's all kind of a part of package. Normally, that's the kind of the conglomerates. Um, when we start getting into some of the standalone controls manufacturers, like Lutron or Enlighted or um, others, you may wind up seeing devices that um, uh, get OEM'd to manufacturers and installed in the fixture there. And so that's a slight difference, but not a, not a major one. Um, at the moment, um, about half of the manufacturers that we work with do LLLC standard. About half are on the way to doing. Then they're all going to have uh, some kind of switch or dimmer, right? Um, usually they're going to be battery operated. About half of the manufacturers also have um, power uh, switches that, you know, you basically take a, a um, 120 volt convenience circuit to it to give it some power, and then it communicates wirelessly to the various devices. Usually those are in the systems that use what we call a mesh network. You remember we talked about mesh and star networks yesterday. Um, so if the, if the um, um, switch is going to wind up being a repeater node on the network, that's when it would typically require power. Uh, they'll all have some flavor of occupancy or vacancy sensor, right? They'll either be in the in the ceiling, on the wall, uh, they might be in the fixture themselves. Um, 
most of these systems now have gone to wireless um, approaches. If you have an LLC fixture, of course, it's automatically wired into the fixture, so there's, there's nothing there. Most of the manufacturers do have an option for wired sensors, but frankly, they're, they're kind of more pain than they're worth in most cases. Uh, same with daylight sensors, right? We have a variety of different types of daylight sensors, open loop, closed loop, combination, combination of the ones that combine both open loop and closed loop. So you point one arrow at the window wall and so it looks out and then it also looks down, that sort of averages the results, that's good. Of course, the uh, uh, LLC fixtures are basically all closed loop. They're all looking down at the, at the work surface. Uh, integrated sensors, most of the uh, actual LLC sensors are integrated, right? So they're both daylight and occupancy vacancy sensors. And some of them have additional uh, sensing capabilities as well, right? Temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, um, there might be others that they have in there. Uh, plug load controllers. Um, and I'm going to skip this next pop quiz because we, we're having some good discussion here. but. The answer is, do all network lighting control systems require communication hubs? The answer is no. Not everyone requires them, but it is common. Um, probably two thirds of the network lighting control systems are based on um, communication hubs. Now, if you go into some of the other kind of systems that we, we talked briefly about, like for example, uh, PoE, power over ethernet, you would wind up having a hub which essentially is an ethernet switcher, right? And that would live in a um, in a closet somewhere, and then you would have have uh, wires going from it to the various light fixtures. Again, if you want to see more about that, go to the uh, Lighting Design Lab Education page and take a look at Armando's class that is specifically about PoE. It talks about that. Okay. So um, back to the demonstration boards. This is what we would be programming, right? So we would have five different control zones and we would tie in the individual load controllers. Hopefully these look very common to you now. We might have in this particular case, these are wired uh, uh, sensors that wire into the load controllers themselves, but we would also have uh, wireless sensors, wireless switches, all that stuff. And we would do it for again, two or four different manufacturers. So once you've got all the hardware, you know, how do you, how do you kind of think about this stuff? Well, again, all of these systems are now programmable based on these smartphone apps, right? So, um, some of you may be old enough as I am to remember the days of punch card programming, but we used to think about programming as being something that was complicated. I actually had a stack of punch cards like this when I was in high school and um, literally tripped. I had, I had probably three or four hundred punch cards for individual steps and tripped going over to the compiler. The compiler was in fact a hopper that read them all, right? So um, it was quite an interesting time trying to reorder them properly. Um, we don't have to really worry about that anymore. We're also used to the idea of smartphone apps that literally every or almost every smart building system in the smart building ecosystem is heading in this direction so that we all have some commonality of um, experience. Right? I hope that makes sense. So the apps are generally downloadable right, from the uh, Google Play or the iPhone store, uh, sometimes from the manufacturers themselves. Um, and I want to stress that not always are these programmed by apps. Um, sometimes it's a combination of a computer and an app for fine tuning. Uh, most of the time it's, it's completely the app, but they also offer the opportunity to do things with computers as well. If you prefer, for example, um, you know, you might you might have a computer that that logs into one of the hubs and communicates as if it was a web page, for example, right? Okay. So, how do we do all this stuff, right? Well, the first step is to establish communications, right? We we establish communications between our smart device, smart device, and the the um, hub, and then what, right? What do we do? Well. Everybody's devices are going to be a little bit different, right? Everybody's systems are going to be a little bit different. Some apps will actually guide you step by step by step through the process. 
some apps will assume that you are more of a power user and will need to sort of either know how to use this system or know enough about lighting controls to figure it out. But effectively, the same kinds of steps have to happen in all cases, right? We discover the devices. So what does that mean? Um, usually, the system will do one of two things. You'll either be able to hit a quick button and the hub or the mesh network will immediately start paying out and query the entire area and try to find all of the devices that are in that area the load controllers, the switches, the sensors, all of that stuff, the, the uh, smart receptacles. Find all of that stuff, it will populate it into a big sort of mass of devices that you can then distribute into various areas within, within the, uh, the project, right? Another way to think about that, uh, however, is that there are some systems that have either specific codes that are embedded on the, the devices themselves, QR codes, barcodes, uh, that you would peel off and put them on a set of plans, um, it, there's, there's pluses and minuses to each step, right? The QR code um, approach requires more upfront work, uh, but saves time in the field. The automatic dis device discovery um, requires very little upfront work, but it takes time in the field because once it discovers all the systems, you have to actually blink each one so that you know that um, what it thinks of as control zone XXXY is in fact the downlight over there. XXXZ is in fact the two by four over there. Right? I hope that makes sense. Okay. A couple of steps that I like to um, really, really do here. One is uh, add the project information. A lot of times people skip this. What is the name? What is the location? Right? Those are useful, particularly when you're trying to get uh, help from the factory because they'll, they'll also know some of this stuff. What is the longitude and latitude? Well, why do I want that? It's in case I'm doing any kind of astronomic time clock control, right? And then I also want to have an information about who the designer was, the engineer might be. And the reason for that is that I know what the system is supposed to be. You know, I, I've got projects now that are that are 30 years old. If somebody, you know, uh, on that project, say in in Maine, wants to know why I did something, I'd rather have them just contact me and ask me. Take me five minutes to tell them why I did something, rather than have them try to puzzle something out. A uh, more local version of that is uh, the Amgen Helix campus up on Pier 90, which uh, currently actually is Expedia now. But um, you know, I designed that in the, the late 90s, and it went ahead and um, we did a lighting controls upgrade in the uh, 2010 or so. Um, and they were able to uh, instantly identify that I was the lighting designer and uh, work with me to help them understand what the, the criteria were and, and all those things, very useful. All right, so after that, we're going to go ahead and most commonly define the physical areas or rooms within the space. Now, some manufacturers call these zones, which is, is uh, zones or groups, which is um, one of the problems with the lighting control industry right now, frankly, is that there is not enough commonality of nomenclature. Um, people really need to figure out what they want to call things and uh, have some commonality of vocabulary throughout. But essentially, we define each particular area, right? So that that then means that we can associate all the devices with it, all the control zones, all the materials, and then we can program scenes. So if we've got the area in the room, we add in the control zones, right? Now, this might be using the QR codes, it might be blinking uh, each device. So we see that zone 127, okay, this is what that is. Zone 128, that's what that is. Okay, that's fine. I would go ahead also and take the time to uh, name this in each one of the control apps. So I would go ahead and call it zone 1-27. I might also add in office linear type L20, L2-1, office linear type L2-1. Essentially, again, so that I'm taking a little bit of time up front that hopefully will save time uh, down the road, right? I'd go ahead and add any of the plug load controllers as well as the, the zone controllers within the space, load controllers. 
And then I would add in the switches and dimmers, right? Uh, most of the time, whether you're doing QR code or auto discovery, the systems will actually know exactly what the configuration of the switch is, right? Is it a two button on off switch? Is it a three button switch with raise lower? Is it a five button um, preset select station with raise lower? That automatically happens. I would go ahead if, if there's a specific reason to, I'd go ahead and name them too if there was some kind of, like if I had, if I had a big ballroom or a classroom, I might name them so I knew which one switch. Go ahead and add in the vacancy and occupancy sensors. Uh, I might also at this time go ahead and do things like set timeout, the sensitivity, um, is it a vacancy sensor, is it an occupancy sensor, um, is there some kind of logical function, although normally I would do the logical function with some kind of scheduling setup. Is there a, a lower bound to, to how low they want to be when there's nobody in the space, things like that. Um, I would add in the daylight harvesting sensors, right? The, the uh, photo sensors do those things. Um, and then I would go ahead and go about pairing, right? So what does that mean? Pairing refers to the idea that if we've got all of these switches and occupancy sensors and um, daylight sensors, what devices are going to be controlled by Oh, sorry, what load controllers or what control zones are going to be controlled by what occupancy or vacancy sensors or daylight sensors or switches and dimmers. And then I would also start to do things like define uh, groups, uh, logical groups, or the scenes and presets. So I would go ahead and develop the scenes themselves open office plan morning, open office plan afternoon, open office plan evening. And then I would go ahead and pair the individual control zones with each one of those scenes. And then within each one of those scenes, I would go ahead and select the specific light levels. Right? I would set the light levels within each one of those scenes of each one of those control zones, and I would save it so that it would be repeatable. Right? Uh, task tuning. Uh, I would then also uh, set the task tuning, set the high trim. Now, if I was in a space that was uh, nothing but different spaces, different kinds of areas, I would, I would want to go through with a light meter into every single one of those spaces and um, dim the lighting accordingly to get to my target light level. If I was doing a project that had a lot of iterative spaces that were similar, right? Corporate campus, um, school, a lot of different classrooms, uh, any place like that, uh, healthcare with a lot of different exam rooms, what I would probably do is pick one uh, sort of archetypical space of each type, go ahead and set them with my light meter, and then I would go ahead and copy and paste the dimmed light level to each one of the specific areas within that typology. Go ahead and set up my time of day scheduling. Um, I would make sure that I would have different scheduling events for um, weekdays, weekends, holidays. Um, I might have uh, logical events like changing the occupancy sensors to daylight sensors, all those kinds of good things. Uh, I would go ahead and set up my demand response, right? Again, this is the whole idea that when the electric utility needs me to dim down my lighting to save energy for a time, um, I can dim down wide areas of lighting by small amounts to save huge amounts of energy, right? If I dim down 20% of the, the um, if I dim the lighting down by 20% on a typical project, I'm probably saving 10% of the energy or thereabouts on that entire project, which is significant, right? So um, that can have big, that can have big uh, impacts. Normally speaking with these, these control systems, uh, it's a toggle. Uh, enable demand response, disable demand response. And then you can also select how much you want to dim by, and you can frequently go ahead and uh, select uh, individual control zones to dim or to not dim, do what we call uh, unaffected. All right, so um, that's kind of the programming there. I'm gonna give you uh, just another quick pop quiz here because they're so much fun.
what are the steps we might take in task tuning or high trim setting, right? Providing target light level documentation in the sequence of operations, or taking on-site light level measurements with a light meter, or finding target light level documentation in plans or specs, or guessing what looks good to you and setting the dim light level accordingly, or leave it to someone else. Now, um, while you're answering that, I am going to say that um, there are a number of light level light meter apps that are um, being marketed for smartphones. Um, I will tell you that um, uh, they're worth what you pay for. A light meter is worth what you pay for it. Um, a smart meter app might be, you know, two bucks, three bucks. A uh, high quality professional light meter is a thousand dollars. Now, I let my architecture students at UW use their phones as light meters uh, right now because we are in the, the sort of quarantine period. But normally speaking, I would require them to use light meters that we provide for them in the architecture department. Um, if you want to use a smartphone light meter, go ahead, but just bear in mind that it's not going to be accurate. Um, you know, it might be 15 or 20 or 25 percent off, uh, might be more. But um, so go ahead and do it if you need to. But if you're going to be doing setting high trim, you really want a real uh, professional light meter. All right, let me close this and share the results. So uh, most of you think providing target light level documentation absolutely imperative. Taking on site measurements also imperative. Finding a target light level documentation, also a good idea. Guessing what looks like to you and setting the dim light level, please don't do that. Really go ahead and set it according to what the, what the actual requirement is. Um, and unfortunately, leaving it to someone else is what I find very frequently. Um, task tuning is one of the most frequently overlooked steps in setting up a lighting control system. Um, there are a lot of different reasons for that, but um, it's also one of the best ways that you can harvest huge amounts of energy um, savings with literally doing nothing more than a quick programming step. No hardware is required. Right? So uh, for what it's worth, always, always, always set your high trim task tuning. Okay. So uh, with that, um, are there any questions? Let me advance this. Um, because really, we're going to talk a little bit about the future of lighting controls and some very specific topics. But from a programming standpoint, that's really um, what we're we're kind of going with. Okay, uh, David, what are challenges to implementing advanced lighting control systems on single-family residential projects? Are they practical? Assume a project with modest construction budget where the client probably wouldn't hire a lighting designer and the electrical subcontractor would do design build with input and collaboration. All right, that's an excellent question. Uh, the reality is that the systems that we're talking about here, um, they could sort of be used for a residential project, but realistically, um, they are commercial products. Uh, if I was doing residential, I would probably be looking to think more like some of the residential products. Um, Leviton, Light uh, uh, Leader doesn't exist anymore from a control standpoint. Uh, Lutron, um, they all have kind of radio frequency uh, systems that work for, for uh, residential projects. Um, and there are opportunities for energy savings there, but Again, I would really be focusing much more on the uh, flexibility, the non-energy benefits for residential. And of course, from an energy code standpoint, um, actual residential projects are not currently required to have lighting controls, except in multifamily residential. And in that case, outside of the uh, actual living units, right? So corridors and uh, lobbies, elevator course, things like that would require controls. In my own home, um, I have a combination, actually, of um, the Philips Hue system, which is, is kind of a retrofit system with smart lamps and a um, hub and, and programming from smartphones um, that also matches up with something called a Kasambi 
uh, Bluetooth system, um, depending on what controllers I'm, I'm actually using. But good question. Um, okay, any others before I move on to the future of lighting controls? You've all been very good today. Again, um, the uh, I'm throwing a ton of stuff at you because normally we would be able to address most of the stuff over the course of an entire day instead of two two-hour sessions. Uh, Adrian, is Washington State Code and City of Seattle the same? No, they are not. So um, the state of Washington uh, has its own set of code. Uh, so they're both based on the IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code. The state of Washington has its own set of um, amendments to the IECC, and, uh, which uh, of course affect not just lighting, it's lighting, it's building envelope, HVAC, water heating, all these things. Uh, the city of Seattle, has their own set of amendments, so uh, which are, are typically more, uh, depending on your point of view, more progressive or restrictive. Uh, so you really need to need to absolutely pay attention to that. And again, um, so we did the classes on the Seattle Energy Code and the um, uh, I believe the IDL. If you went to the I uh, Integrated Design Lab webpage or the um, um, Smart Building Center up on um, uh, Beacon Hill. They did a series on the Washington State Code. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about the future of lighting controls. Where do we go from here? Right? What are we? What are we kind of looking at? Well, I'd mentioned to you that um, most utilities are realizing that to continue the energy savings and sustainability that we've been able to deliver from the lighting industry for the last 30 plus years, it really does start to require um, adding in lighting controls because most of the low hanging fruit going from T12 to T8, from magnetic ballast to, to electronic ballast, from uh, those to T5, to, from incandescent to ceramic metal halide, now everything to LED, most of that low hanging fruit has already been plucked or is in the process of being plucked. So lighting controls are really kind of the brave new future. Now, if I was a better prognosticator, I'll, I'll kind of warn you up front, um, I probably wouldn't have sold my Apple stock in 1994 uh, when the Newton kind of, kind of cratered. So um, who knows how good my predictions wind up being. Um, but a big part of our future is going to be the letters I, O, and T, Internet of Things, right? Um, we are very commonly now told that everything needs to communicate with each other, everything needs to be in part of one network. In fact, I was at a conference recently where I was told that um, in this brave new world, we were even going to have, have uh, sensors in our water jugs that would be able to tell us how warm or cool the water was. My sense was, well, I already have a sensor, it's called wetware. The water's lukewarm, it's good enough. I don't know that I actually need a micro uh, electronic sensor in my water jug, right? But whether we want them or not, lighting is going to be a big part of this um, brave new future. Many, many, many retail environments are being outfitted with um, tracking systems that are part of the lighting controls or are powered by the lighting controls. Why? Because the lighting controls are up in the ceiling and they already have power going to them, right? So that gives them an enviable position within the real estate environment. Now, real pop quiz here, how many of you find this a bit creepy? I'm not gonna open this up to you because normally speaking, everybody puts their hands up and says, oh, we all find it creepy. Um, and it is a little bit creepy. Um, the, the fact is that when we talk about things like asset tracking, when we're talking about target, um, you're an asset, I'm an asset, right? They may or may not be targeting or tracking Sean Dara as he walks around the store, but they are tracking the fact that somebody has a Bluetooth emitting device and they spent three minutes in front of that gondola and two minutes in the frozen food section and, you know, however. So they are doing hot, hot mapping. If you have their app on the phone, they probably are specifically tracking you. Now, this is kind of creepy. Um, the good news is that um, big data is collecting so much data that the individualized approach, they're not really collecting specific information about me, right? Uh, as creepy as that kind of sounds. 
but how about some benign uses for some of this stuff, right? What about healthcare, right? If you're in healthcare, an asset might be the crash cart that will revive you when you've had a heart attack. Uh, it might be a patient. So I might go in and I might be coming to have my left kidney removed. I want to be an asset at that point. I want them to track me. I want them to know where I am at every point. And I want them to know with beyond a doubt that I want my left kidney to be taken out, not my right kidney. Now, I might also go ahead and engage some, some um, analog implementation here. I might take a big fat Sharpie and write, take this one and leave this one on my belly before the surgery. But you, you get the point. So asset tracking, not necessarily a bad thing, but it is coming, right? It is going to be part of lighting controls. What about color tuning or circadian lighting or color tuning, however we bring these things together? Now, everybody focuses on the color of light. And the fact is that light fixture manufacturers are going to be manufacturing light fixtures that are color tunable predominantly in all cases in the coming years, right? Because it's easy to manufacture one fixture that you then decide what you want the color temperature to be. But from a circadian or behavioral standpoint, color is only one of the variables with respect to this photobiology stuff. However, if you look at the list here, the key stimulus variables, most of them with the exception of distribution, you can't change the directionality of light necessarily from a control system. They're all controllable by lighting controls. So lighting controls are going to become more and more important as we push forward, right? And even for things like communication, Wi-Fi, we're going to wind up having this notion that we're going to have communication by a pulsed light. Uh, it is already being installed in Europe. We had a, an idea that we were going to install some of these at the lighting lab in order to uh, test it out. Of course, uh, that was before COVID hit. But essentially, all these things are going to tie in with lighting controls. So as a friend of mine who is a contractor said, those of you who are contractors or salespeople or even designers, the future is controls. The future is connected. The future is all of these things. So if you don't pay enough attention to really learn them, understand them, at least become knowledgeable enough to be dangerous about them, right? You're going to be left behind. That's why these are so important. All right. So with that, that's really pretty much what I had to say. I'm going to give you a couple of a couple of key things here. It's been a great day, great yesterday. Um, network lighting control uh, um, resources available on the Lighting Design Lab webpage. We have best practice guides, including some that are specific to project typologies. In the handouts that I gave you yesterday, you'll find this report on commissioning uh, systems with um, LLC versus replacement versus design that Nia put together relatively recently. It's an interesting read. Take a look at that. Um, and of course, before I open it up to questions again, um, upcoming classes, we are heavily focused still on lighting controls. So the next class will be Armando talking about the value proposition of network lighting controls. And Eric will be talking about network lighting controls for warehouses. And I'll be talking about network lighting controls for healthcare. Then we'll rotate back to Armando for network lighting controls for schools. So please go ahead and bookmark these, sign up for them, let us know. Um, this is, of course, how to get in touch with me. We are uh, Seattle, Seattle City Light. Right? Seattle City Light, you can thank the, the uh, City Light for funding and bringing this kind of programming to you guys. Now, with all of that, are there any further questions? Again, apologies for throwing a whole boatload of information at you quickly, but that's kind of the only way to do this, this type of class in this kind of format. Um, I wish we had more time to kind of back and forth discuss things and, and we will again someday when we, uh, once we've all been vaccinated. So thoughts, questions, comments? Anybody?
going once, going twice. All right. Um, I do actually have one more poll that I would like for those of you oh, that are here. We got a we got a question. Okay, I will look at the question. But while while you're doing this, I'm curious about your your opinions with respect to what's going to happen after COVID. So when COVID is behind us, more or less, um, are you going to prefer to work remotely, work back in the office, maybe some kind of equalish blend, or I can't wait to get back to the office. I'm curious about this because I'm having this conversation with a number of uh, architect strategist friends that um, um, that I talk with with at various times, and our opinions on this have changed very radically over the past few, few months, particularly as Zoom fatigue has set in. So let me. Most of you have voted. Let me share the results. And, oops, share, come on, there we go. Um, okay, nobody can wait to get back to the office. That's interesting, I can't wait to get back to the office. I, I love my home office, but this is where I like to do uh, personal video projects and stuff like that. Uh, and equish blend, okay, that, that's, this is all very helpful, thank you very much. So, uh, question, so, sort of off topic. Was that King Street Station on the first slide? Uh, Amanda, yes, um, that is King Street Station. And yes, that's a project that I actually uh, had the pleasure of designing twice, uh, of all things. Um, David Clingston, one of the um, uh, people who is on this call, actually worked on uh, designing it the first time around. So, um, we, we took the project back in the 90s and worked with the uh, state of Washington and OTAC, um, a design firm uh, based out of, out of Portland uh, with offices here in Seattle. Um, and we designed it up to about 95% CD, as I recall, uh, before the state pulled the plug on it because they just couldn't afford it. So I uh, couldn't afford the the to change what was going to be happening. Uh, Hardy Holtzman Pfeiffer out of LA was also involved in that. Um, then there was another brief design attempt with NBBJ and Nitzi Stegen uh, developers uh, before the city got the, the building and um, uh, ZGF were the ones that actually fully brought it together. So um, uh, I can't say that I designed it entirely myself. Um, Almost all of our designers at Pivotal Lighting, when I was running Pivotal Lighting, uh, were involved in that. So, uh, but yes, I um, I was the principal designer for it for the first go around, and then basically everything that we had done from the first time we did in the second time, except that it went from being ceramic metal halide and incandescent to all LED. So, hope that's helpful. Um, all right, any other questions? Any other thoughts? Before we uh, before we say thank you very much, and please go ahead and oops, let's hide this. Uh, please go ahead and as you're leaving, uh, some of you did this yesterday. We appreciate it. Why don't you? There we go. Um, we appreciate it. Please take the online survey before you leave. Uh, we really, really, really appreciate uh, feedback, particularly with any ideas that you might have on classes that uh, we could use in the future, that you could use, that uh, ways that we could help all of you. So with all of that, uh, any other questions, please go ahead and email me. You have my email information and uh, that's all folks. I return you to your day already in progress and have yourselves a fantastic sunny Seattle day or hopefully it's sunny wherever you are.